can buy uh, objects in our gallery for as low as $2 and as high as thousands of dollars. Good evening and welcome to this edition of Black Nouveau. I'm Joanne Williams. This week we'll visit a new multicultural art gallery in the Grand Avenue Mall. We'll join the PBS dialogue on guns and violence and hear some voices that are often unheard in the discussion. We'll also tell you about an upcoming retreat to help end domestic violence. But we begin with Haiti. It's been more than three years since an earthquake caused major damage. As this story from the news hour shows, the earthquake wasn't the only problem to hit the island nation. The 2010 earthquake that devastated Haiti may still loom large in Americans' memory, but in Haiti itself, that was at least three disasters ago. Before hurricanes, Tomas last year, Isaac in August, and recently Sandy. Each storm brought a grim reminder of yet one more ever-present disaster, the deadly cholera epidemic that started 10 months after the quake. At the cholera ward of St. Luke's Hospital, just outside the capital, Port-au-Prince, Dr. Jackinson Davilmar says since Hurricane Sandy, admissions have doubled from 20 to 40 patients each day. Most of the new cases are coming from further up the hill in places like Petchenville, where we had not seen them before. I'm not positive, but perhaps the wells there have been contaminated. Experts believe cholera was brought here by UN peacekeepers at the time a battalion from Nepal. Untreated sewage from this base flowed into a tributary of the Artibonit River, the major source of water for both washing and drinking. Cholera is spread by fecal-oral contact. Two years on, 600,000 Haitians have been sickened. 7,500 have died from the extreme diarrhea and fluid loss. Each flood brings more contaminated water more cases. Dr. Patrick Belgard-Smith joins us now. He's a professor emeritus of Africology from UWM and a native Haitian. Welcome to Black Nouveau. I'm glad to be here. Uh, talking about the earthquake in Haiti made all sorts of headlines, all sorts of people were interested uh, when it happened. And the piece we just saw uh, concluded by talking about the disease that has struck the nation, cholera. What have you heard about that? Well, the cholera was brought in by United Nations troops from Nepal, and it was proven uh, rather conclusively that this is where it originated from, and we had not had cholera outbreaks before. And so it's, it's been tough going. So along with the aid yes. and the aid givers yes. came disease. Came disease as well. So can't win. <laughs> but tell me a little bit about uh, your home in Haiti and what happened to it in the earthquake. Well, we have a very large family compound in the central part of Port-au-Prince, about a block away from the National Palace and about four blocks away from the uh, Roman Catholic Cathedral. And the modern structures that were in cement collapsed. But my grandfather's home, which is about 150 years old, remained pretty much intact. And so it gives us a clue that uh, old structures were built to last, and also the earthquake was unable to attack it but the modern structures disappeared. And his home was built of wood? Of wood, yeah. So it that didn't survived. collapse. That survived. Where, you weren't in Haiti when the earthquake no. struck. You were here. Where were you when you heard about it? I was at my desk at UWM, uh, waiting for students to come into my office, when I got a call from a friend in Milwaukee who told me that this had happened. And at first I didn't believe it, because we had not had an earthquake in a while. Uh, we had some small ones in the 1940s, but the last big one that occurred in Port-au-Prince was back in the 1800s. When you first heard about it, what did you think? Well, I uh, thought that it was probably minor, but as it turned out, it was a big one, especially occurring as it did in a very populated place of the world uh, with three million inhabitants in Port-au-Prince alone. So it meant catastrophe uh, because of that. Any of your relatives lost their lives? I had six distant cousins, younger people who died. But people my generation did survive, even though their, uh, their homes collapsed. Once the reality set in that this was a really major earthquake hitting your, your home island, what did you want to do? What did you want to say? Well, I knew I could not get back home because uh, 
tra air traffic was suspended, of course. And so I spent three nights, uh, three days and three nights, uh, uh, not being able to sleep in front of CNN, essentially, uh, listening to them babbling along, total, absolute nonsense about Haiti. They seem to have known nothing about it. Uh, Miseducation from the word go. And they're trying to reach family members there. It was about seven days before I reached my family members. What, what's one thing that the media got wrong about Haiti? Well, the entire sweep of Haitian history and what Haiti was all about was misunderstood. For instance, at one point, uh, Demi Moore says to uh, uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, we have to bring freedom to Haiti to complete Abraham Lincoln's dream. Well, Haiti freed itself all by itself in 1804. And she's talking about Abraham Lincoln and to, fill, to fulfill his dream. That made no sense at all. Nobody bothered to correct her. Mm. Since the earthquake, how has Haiti changed? Have things been rebuilt? Is the island, uh, does it have a stable government? Uh, well, what's yes, there is an elected government, which is trying as best as it can. But the word went out a very long time ago, several decades ago, that the Haitian government should be weakened. And the U.S. government has done all in its power to weaken the Haitian government because it prefers to hand over power, as it were, to foreign corporations and foreign enterprises. And so the government is oftentimes unable to act because it does not have the resources. And so this has complicated matters further. But millions of dollars were raised. Billions. Where did those billions of dollars go? Well, in the first blush, uh, when the first millions arrived, for instance, from the part of the U.S. government, 33% of that money went to bring in U.S. Marine and U.S. soldiers on Haiti. And those people refused to distribute water because we expected Haitians to riot. So they were kept without water for several days. Uh, this is the Katrina story all over again, very much like Katrina. And so when, when the Haitians finally received water, they were quite happy about it, and there were no riots in the country. Mm. Will you go back? Yes, I'll be back in November. And what do you and, expect? Um, it's going to be very painful. Uh, all the schools I went to have been destroyed. All the churches I attended have been destroyed. The National Palace, and I, I have been to the National Palace visiting with several Haitian uh, presidents over a period of time, is gone. Uh, the Basilica, the, the Roman Catholic Cathedral is gone. The Anglican Cathedral is gone. There is very little left of my youth, actually. When you come back from Haiti, will you come back and visit us and yes, let us know course. what you saw yes, and what course. you experienced? Yes, of course. We'll welcome your perspectives when Thank you return. You. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today. Happy to be here. Asia Fine Art Gallery and Boutique is located in Milwaukee's downtown Grand Avenue Mall. It's a multicultural gallery devoted to artists of all ethnic groups. Cynthia Hendry, an art collector and now a gallery owner, makes visiting her gallery an educational experience. First of all, I like to give uh, my patrons and clients that come into the gallery a tour of the gallery, and I like to acquaint them with the artists. And um, I find out what their interests are, where they would like to place the art, and um, find out really what they know. Oftentimes people think that art is out of their means and they can't afford it. And I tell everyone that comes in my gallery, well, you can buy a great piece of art for a nominal price point. You can buy uh, objects in our gallery for as low as $2 and as high as thousands of dollars. As a gallerist, Henry has to keep up with the market. I have to be able to um, decide who is a great artist, what is great art, what does the public want. Along with working with individuals to find the best in art, Henry works with artists to move their careers forward. I work with the emerging market and artists that are mature in their practice also. And I'm trying to be a communal space here in Milwaukee where everyone can come and find something of interest here. Other things that we look for in art, especially um, 
with your emerging artists, you, you look for those that have strength and um, have a passion for the art and to make sure that they are work, working steadily in their practice. And you can be assured that they will probably do well in the art world. So we've amassed um, a collection that's local and national, um, filled with artists from all over the country. Francis Anana Ghana, and then, um, and one of um, my stable artists is Patricia Obelitz, who is a longtime artist who moved here from New York several years ago, but has um, learned under the masters. And her work has even appeared on magazine covers, it's been on theater covers. The newest artist that I have is Marlon Banks of Madison, Wisconsin. He is a great realist painter. Current featured artist, who is Gary Markstein, who is a locally and nationally known um, throughout the country. He, has, he was a former editorial cartoonist on the editorial board with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And most recently, he is uh, co-authoring uh, a cartoon series in the Sunday papers that is syndicated. Another um, new discovery is the artist um, Isima, who is from Iran. She's been in the United States about five, uh, about five years. She does beautiful work in oils. I'm also excited about my new photographer, uh, Christopher McIntyre, better known as CMP, who does um, a lot of local scene. He, he catches the vibrancy of Milwaukee street scenes and black and white photography. The gallery is ever evolving and being a communal space, not only will you see art, but there are book signings and installations in her project room. In the project room, I have installations that are placed by various artists. Now in the project room, I have Darlene Delamar who has um, done a very unique take on Alice in Wonderland, which involves covering her childhood in Gary, Indiana, and how she relates to Alice and looking through the looking glass. I believe that everyone should be able to acquire art at any, um, regardless of your economic background you can uh, find something that is pleasing to your eye, something that is beautiful and something that you can cherish. The black man wasn't equal to the white man in the 60s. We didn't know if we were gonna make it back across that bridge. I think that was the scariest moment of my life. We're in this thing for the long struggle, and you know, if it takes filling up the jails, we're gonna fill up the jails, but we're not gonna stop until this issue is resolved. Next Wednesday evening at 6.30. Many of the programs on PBS this week have focused on the issue of guns and violence in our society. The tragedies in Newtown, Oak Creek, and the Brookfield Spa were horrific. But so is the fact that so much violence happens in poor urban neighborhoods on a regular basis. We asked poet and community activist Kwabena Antoine Nixon to talk about that with some members of Milwaukee's Central City. The most pressing issue in the African American community is violence. Myself, I'm 43 years old, and over the years I've lost a new number of friends. At one time, a friend of mine did a study. Uh, just putting some thoughts together and he came up with this thought that since 19, probably 70 something, all the way up until now, there's been close to 274,000 black males killed. Today I'm sitting with two young men who are closely affected, to that, uh, who closely affected by their violence. Uh, Mr. Montrell Robinson and my good friend, uh, Marshall. So, good brothers, how y'all doing today? Fine. Uh, good. All right. Uh, if I can, Montreal, I've known you uh, probably what since you were 
I say about six. Six years old. All right. That was in Montreal. That was six years old. And there's the Montreal Robinson now, who's been through a few things in your lifetime. How did violence affect your 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 childhood or just your life at all? In pe period. <clears throat> I say violence. Violence actually affected me. Like seeing my mother beat when I was little, growing up. It, it changed my ways, how I re actually react to women, mm -hmm. how I treat them. So either I'd be like my stepfather or I'd be like a man that I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Violence affected me in ways like I see everything going on the street corner. So either do I veer this way or veer the next way? Mm -hmm. Like do I sell rocks or do I finish school? Mm -hmm. So being a victim to all that, being able to witness and stay in that community, I took the best of both worlds. Okay. Like, I, I, I got incarcerated because of violence. Mm -hmm. I lost close friends because of violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, honestly, I lost half my life because of violence. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just because coming up the way I did and the areas that I did, because, I mean, we bounced, on, bounced around a lot, and um, you see a variety of different things. All the areas, it's like they had their subtle differences, but the same thing, gun violence, mm -hmm. you know, gang violence, all types of things like that. So, you mean, when you're that young, you're thinking about the way you see it is you want to make your point, make your statement, make your mark on the world before you get to the point where, because you didn't think, couldn't see yourself living past 18, mm -hmm. couldn't see yourself reaching 21. So mm -hmm. you wanted to just make your mark on the world any way possible, whether it be negative or positive. And it was just, it was, the outcome was kind of, it wasn't to be expected for me to get here. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an amazing, amazing feeling. What is it about making your mark that's so important? Well, I have to say the difference is it's not cultural at, at all. It's um, generational. Mm -hmm. We grow up in a generation where, you know, instead of like in suburban areas, you brag about, you know, who got the biggest bike or, you know, the best looking girlfriend, who mom and dad make the most money. Mm -hmm. Where we come from, it's like, you know, we arguing over who can, who quicker, got the better hands, who can hit harder, things mm -hmm. like that. So we grow up shadow boxing and slap mm -hmm. fighting. And then eventually, you know, like what's growth without development? Mm -hmm. So you go to that next, you go to that next stage and you actually beating somebody where you jump in somebody or you go to the next stage where you got a gun and it's gun violence. So mm -hmm. we come from that and it's, it, by making your mark, it's like, how fast did you get to that point? Mm -hmm. Or how, how deep were you in it? Because you want to gain the respect of your peers instead of elders and people mm -hmm. who actually are doing something in the community, people who matter, you care more about the opinion of your peers. What did you not get as a young man in a violent area that needs to be done right now? I, I say more role models. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to actually understand and look at role models nine days, they ain't present. Mm -hmm. Like, if I go back to ninth and rank where I grew up at, our role models was people that sold dope on the corner. Mm -hmm. Our role models, they weren't the teachers, they weren't our parents. Mm -hmm. Like they were the people who robbed the liquor store, mm -hmm. the people that sold drugs. Like mm -hmm. bring, bring more people that's willing to go in schools, talk, bring more Kwabana Nixon. Like just actually a male figure that's there to tell you when you wrong and right. Mm -hmm. That go guide you through thick and thin. Mm -hmm. To actually give you that helping hand when need be. Mm -hmm. And not always enable a person. Mm -hmm. Just a role model, just a stand there. A, a mother that ain't gonna baby me, but mm -hmm. accept me for who I am. That, that go, will tell me when I'm wrong and not spoil me mm -hmm. because I want the brand new shoes or the brand new shirts and all that. Mm -hmm. and does the media play a role in portraying violence, hiding it, or making it aware, or un 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 unfair portrayal? Honestly, I, I can say yes. You gotta look at it. Yes to what? The media do play a role okay. in violence. I did a workshop one day, and one of the gentlemen said, I wanted to be Nino Brown. Mm. I'm like, in my era, didn't nobody actually think about that. Everybody mm -hmm. was just living a dream. Mm -hmm. Like, we were just chasing a dream that we didn't know what was possible. We didn't know if it was positive or whatnot. Right. Like, look at South Central. Mm -hmm. You can even look at Baby Boy when he constantly beat his wife. Mm -hmm. Look at all the other movies that's portraying boys in the hood mm -hmm. when gang members being killed. Anything of that sort. Like, you, the children in the black urban community like want to be them. What can we do? What kind of responsibility can we take as individuals and groups? We have to take it upon ourselves to not only, you know, speak out against it, but not to be hypocritical because we can't, you know, 
we have to be role models even when nobody's watching. So mm. you, ha you can't just, you know, talk about putting the guns down and talk about changing your community and then go home. <laughs> and yeah. the same thing, right, so right, you can't right. do it. It doesn't work that way. And we have to just take, everyone has to find it within themselves to take pride in being, you know, nonviolent. Mm. You have to celebrate yourself, you know, treat yourself if that's what it takes. Like, you have to be a responsible human being and contribute to making not only your community or your environment better, but the, or the planet. Like mm -hmm. we universally, we have to get better at taking pride in our self self awareness and just feeling like you like ask yourself when you get home at the end of the day, what did you do today to make the world a better place? Mm -hmm. And if you can't give yourself an honest answer that you could feel good about, you need to go back outside. We're joined now by Monty Mabra, producer and writer of Voice of the Fatherless Child. His information about an upcoming retreat on domestic violence. Why did you want to organize this retreat? Uh, because the effect that domestic violence is having on our community right now uh, needs to be addressed uh, from both aspects, uh, both the perpetrator and, and both the survivors. Uh, we have a uh, become somewhat kind of biased towards one or the other. Uh, and domestic violence doesn't just consist of men beating women, but also women beating men. And children uh, are victims of domestic violence, and seniors are domestic victims of domestic violence as well. Why did you want to organize this retreat? What has happened in your life that inspired you to do this? Uh, I, I once was a, a batterer. Uh, I used violence because I had no coping skills. I, I didn't know how to express myself or my feelings, so that was my ticket out. It was, it kind of reminded me of when I was in class and the teacher asked me a question that I couldn't answer. Instead of being a dumb kid that couldn't answer the question, I'd knock something over or have a tantrum to divert from answering the question. And everybody said, oh, Monty wilding out. I could live with Monty wilding out. I couldn't live with Monty not having an answer to the question. Did your family try and change this kind of reaction to situations, or did they not? Uh, my mother disciplined me uh, for my behavior at times, and sometimes she may have over-disciplined me, but I think a, a missing component was I didn't, my father wasn't present to give me the information that was necessary. Now, you said we, we talk about, mostly about the women who are victims of domestic violence. How can a man be a victim of domestic violence, aside from a child, as, as was your situation? Uh, because men are so, are taught to be so masculine that they don't even recognize when they're being victimized. And they wouldn't tell you. It's like when a woman comes home and say, you no good for nothing, you don't pay no rent, you don't pay the gas bill, the car note, you don't do, you ain't got no job. And all of these things are like direct slaps in the face. It's verbal abuse and the, and the man doesn't know how to say, excuse me, calm down. The way you're talking to me is hurting me. It's upsetting me. Instead, he just goes into defense mode and let me bring her down to my level. And he uses violence because he has no coping skills. I'm not saying that the violence that he uses is the right uh, thing to do, but he has no coping skills. And that's what we're trying to do, uh, give him information on how to have coping skills to address situations when he's being placed in a situation like that. One of the young men in the video said that we have to learn to take pride in being nonviolent. Mm -hmm. How can we teach people to do that? How can we teach people to say, wait a minute, this is bothering me. I'm not going to hit you. I'm going to step back and relax. I had an older guy tell me, he said, any situation you can think your way out of without using your fist, you won it. And I took pride in that saying, oh, I can talk my way out of something. If I can talk my way out of a fight, I didn't master it. The person don't even know he's just been, he's been bamboozled because I'm talking my way out of a fight. And I can take pride in that within myself that I did not have to use physical force or violence to get my point across. Is that something you're going to be sharing at the retreat? I'm going to share every bit of information I can share to save a life and to help anyone that needs it. Should women take the same approach? Should they try and talk their way out of being abused? Uh, yes, women should take, what we're doing is we're teaching exiting skills, uh, safe exiting skills. 
uh, sometimes it's not always necessary to stand up for yourself when you see the warning signs that uh, there's potential harm. So what we want to do is we want to teach exiting skills so they can see these warning signs and say, okay, I need to make a different decision uh, so I can exit this safely uh, without harm to myself or harming him or her. For, well, for people who are in a situation, give me one example of an exiting sign. An uh, exiting sign is when you can tell that he's agitated. Uh, and you can tell that the situation isn't finna go the way you want to go and you're trying to leave the situation. It's not a good time to say, I'm through with you. I don't want to be with you. And he's telling you, you can't leave me. It's not, it's not a safe decision to make at that time. It's better off to let him go to work or, to, <laughs> you know, find a, a, a safe exit. And then you can, you can address it. So some of these skills are going to be shared at the, uh, at the retreat? Yes, it will. We are networking together retreat, dealing yeah. with domestic violence, and if people want to find out about it, they can get in touch with you? Yes, they can. They can simply call 414-875-8075. Uh, Again, 414-875-8075. They can call, they can get information, or they can simply show up at Destiny at 7210. North 76, uh, Friday, March 1st at 5 o'clock. It's going to be a two-day conference? It's a two-day. Yep, okay. two days. Begins on Friday? Begins on Friday, ends on Saturday. Anybody can come? It's open to anybody? It's open to anyone. All right. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today. We'll see how many people attend and how many people get the message that there is a way out. Okay. Thank you for having me. And finally tonight, a reminder that the Black Church Week of Prayer for the Healing of AIDS is from March 3rd through the 9th at Faith Church. For more information, contact the Black Health Coalition of Wisconsin. The number is 414-933-0064. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for watching, and good night.